see this feedback immediately. Okay, and this is all uh, made more difficult by the fact that in realistic problems, uh, state spaces are much bigger rather than this uh, grid world example. So here is, uh, at least a year ago, this was one of the state of the art problems in a simulator, which was to turn this cube to the orientation on the left. And this is one of uh, sort of our demos. Right, so this agent, uh, this is a deployed policy, but it showed a position and it turns the cube so that uh, the die side faces, uh, up, facing up matches that of the, uh, the position. So it matches that of the, the top left cube. Okay, and this is a very large state space because we've got the state of the hand, which is about, you know, like 15 joints. Uh, and we've got the velocities of the hands. We've also got the state of the cube, which is the position of the cube, uh, its orientation and velocity. And these are all continuous states on top of that. Okay, so in addition to handling these first two challenges, uh, which is exploration and delayed reward, there's a question of how do we handle these large and infinite state spaces? Okay. And this is really one of the modern challenges in uh, practical reinforcement learning systems. Yeah? Do you find that this is potentially very hard to do this kind of thing? The, of the continuous uh, variables? The precision meaning? What you have to maintain. Uh, well, we don't discretize anything, so we just see the continuous variables. Uh, so, so this is the question, right? Your sensors, so, so, okay, so just to repeat, so since you're asking, do we find the precision, if I understand correctly, the precision of maybe the sensor variables that we utilize, does that have to be very high? And in a sense, this is the problem with sim to real because in a simulator, we can make it arbitrarily high and just train on it, but there's a problem that a simulator is never quite perfect, so when we transfer to the real world, uh, how, uh, you know, what's the precision issues? And that really isn't known because chances are the dynamics are a bit wrong as well. Uh, so it's a subtle point. Yeah. Well, but I think that's one of the answers that this is also the model is never known in the transition. Yes. The world. So therefore, I don't think sometimes you have to be very bad with this. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah. That, that's also true. But often when it's trained, sometimes you train it quickly without noise and then see how robust it is with noise. Uh, ben. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, if you come back from, for my next talk in the RO, and I'll talk about the role of models, but these are trained with physics simulators. So these robotics settings are very interesting because they are, in fact, trained uh, with physics simulators, and then they try to transfer for, for them to the real world. And by and large, many of the successful applications are trained with physics simulators. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. This, this will be... More fun with questions. Uh, OK, so this last question, how do we deal with the large state spaces? Well, you know, supervised learning to the rescue here. Right? So can we leverage our successes in supervised learning and deep learning and apply them to RL? OK, and supervised learning, it's an interactive, uh, so it's a non-interactive learning setting. We know how to generalize in that setting. Can we use our ability for generalization to deal with this large state space issue? And this is really this uh, you know, new-ish idea of deep RL, which is let's try to plug in some neural networks to deal with this large state space issue. OK, so deep RL and neural nets, all new in this space? Well, not really. So the first systematic treatment of using RL with neural networks was, in fact, uh, this book by Bertsekas and Siklis, where they really were considering the use of neural networks as universal function approximators, and what's the implication with regards to stability when we plug this into dynamic programs and Markov decision processes. Okay, and you know, this was nearing the end of maybe phase two when these deep nets were very popular. And uh, the drawback of that approach is it didn't give us a handle into generalization because it was all worst case results. The, the first result with regards to generalization was really due to this conservative policy iteration algorithm where they gave an average case reduction that said, 
Uh, we can do reinforcement learning well based on the error of certain supervised learning subproblems. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, but the real question here is what do we do in practice? Okay, because at least based on this earlier work, we do have some theory. It turns out it's the strongest theory when we have a supervised learning black box. There's reason to believe, uh, at least in this setting, you can't get better results. But in practice, it's policy gradient methods all the way down. Okay, they're really the most effective method for state of the art. There's lots of other things we'll uh, put into them to get them to work, but they're the bread and butter tool, and it's very hard to get uh, you know, on some domains, maybe something else would be non-trivial, but really across the board, uh, they're the methods we use. And why do we like them? Well, the great at dealing with large state and action spaces, because you just write down various parametric functional forms, uh, it's relatively easy to get gradients because you can get gradients of your value function just by simulation access. I'm not going to go into those details, but if you just have a policy and you can interact with the world or your simulator, it's actually very, very easy to get gradients. And you know, the one thing we kind of know is that if we have a cost function, directly optimizing it is always a good idea. And these things really directly optimize the cost function of interest. So there are a variety of reasons why we should consider them. And this talk is really about trying to get a provable characterization of these methods to see why they're good and what their shortcomings are, because they are the bread and butter tool we have. They're dealing with large state spaces. We're seeing lots of successes, yet we have very little in the way of characterizing their behavior, even in small state spaces. So we're going to start by looking at uh, small state spaces where you might expect convergence to the, op the globally optimal policy, and we'll look at that case. And then we'll move on to large, spaces, large state spaces, looking at this question of function approximation. And it turns out this is going to be related to robustness. OK, and definitely just ask questions as we go along. OK, so I'll do a quick note on landscapes, because sometimes it is helpful uh, to start with some very crude understanding of the, uh, the shape of the objective functions we're trying to optimize. And at supervised learning, uh, I think it's safe to say that we're not too concerned about gradient descent finding bad answers to a large extent because of the natural supervised problems that arise don't really seem to have nasty saddle points. Right? This sort of saddle point of we're trying to do minimization, if we're at that little valley, we just shake the system a little and we'll fall out and continue to make progress. Because that's kind of the the picture of supervised learning. And certainly, many people here had a much richer characterization, like Nadi, uh, Jason, Sanjeev, Simon. Uh, it's certainly a hot topic in the deep learning community right now to really understand how to think about uh, not just the landscape, but actually how, the, how we generalize. Okay, but in reinforcement learning, uh, this picture is really just not correct, that saddle points generally are a problem. Uh, and it's very easy to find natural problems where your objective function is very, very flat. So you know, in a recent paper, we show that for this objective function, so your agent starts all the way at the left, two actions take you to the left, one action takes you to the right. You start any policy, it's pretty much going to be random. It's going to take exponential time to hit the, the goal state, and your gradient is going to be flat. And it's going to be flat, essentially, up to very high orders. So, uh, so this is really bad for an optimization method if the objective function is just to uh, optimize things at S0, certainly in terms of sample size. Yes? If you have a random policy, the right policy, you're just going to go right and pick up the reward. But if you, you start with a random policy because you don't know what the right policy is, two actions are taking you to the left and one to the right. So at best, exponential uh, but you know, if you're deterministic, I could make the MDP get zero reward. Okay, so, uh, so in a sense, saddle problems, you know, roughly speaking, I could say this is due to the lack of exploration that causes saddle, saddle points. Okay, so you can get very, very ill-conditioned problems in, in a real sense. Okay, so uh, that said, let's start looking at Stochastic policies now, because we want to do gradient descent. Policies, uh, to, to take derivatives of policies, if we have discrete actions, it's most natural to let our policies be stochastic. 
Okay, so one way to parameterize these stochastic policies is we say the probability of some action given S is proportional to E to some score function F theta of SA. Okay, so theta is, so F is some differentiable function, and F theta SA is the kind of score we're going to assign to the state action pair SA. So the larger that is, the more likely we're to take action A in state S. Okay, this is a couple uh, natural choices of F here to consider that we'll look at here. So the simplest one is like, look, let's just have one parameter for every state action pair, then we can represent every policy, so we should be, so at least contains the optimal policy. Okay, so another natural one is our favorite approximator, uh, at least for simplicity, is this linear one. So let's suppose we have some set of features in D dimensions where D hopefully is much smaller than the dimension of our state space. And uh, what's the behavior of these methods for that kind of function class? And of course, our, uh, the one we use now is our favorite neural networks, that F could be some deep neural network, possibly with various structural constraints in it. And what's the behavior of using a method like this? Okay. So these are three classes we want to consider. And let's look at our optimization algorithm. Uh, again, I said pretty much all of the methods are gradient-based. And there are usually variants of this natural policy gradient method that Alad mentioned, like this TRP is a natural one. And the motivation for this algorithm is that we're moving around on this simplex on the right. So this is the probability simplex, which has to uh, sum to one in two dimensions, so every point there sums to one. And near the boundaries of the simplex, we're going to start moving very, very slowly. And note, for every state, we have a probability simplex, because for every state, we have a distribution of reactions. Uh, and what this Fisher information matrix does is it kind of warps the simplex so that near the corners of the simplex, it pushes them out to infinity. So it lets you uh, travel a bit more near the corners of the simplex in an appropriate way. Okay, and it's a little more subtle in the reinforcement learning setting because we have a family of probabilistic distributions because for every state, we have a distribution over actions. So we've got a family of distributions, but the Fisher matrix we consider in this algorithm is a weighting over these states. Okay, so this is the algorithm. It's, this, it's basically a, just a preconditioner, but it was motivated by geom geometric considerations, uh, and we really didn't have a proof then, uh, and nor for these other algorithms. Okay, but that's the one we're going to consider because uh, it turns out it's, um, there's a variety of reasons we can, uh, we'll consider this algorithm. You can look at the paper for that. Um, so let's start with a case of small state spaces. And, uh, right, so that first uh, function class is uh, the softmax policy class or the Gibbs policy class. Okay, so it's a little surprising that if you run this algorithm, sorry, that should uh, replace the one, one minus gamma squared with one over h uh, as a typo from uh, switching from the discounted to cumulative reward horizon. So anyway, there's this constant setting of the learning rate uh, such that after t iterations, our value is close to opt by uh, two times your horizon squared over t. Okay, and so this is a bit surprising. Uh, well, one, it's just surprising because it's clean. There's no crazy constants or anything like that. Uh, why else is it surprising? There's no dependence on S or A. So, so there's no dependence on the, the size of the state space or the size of the action space. So it's truly dimension free. Yes? And there's no dependence on any condition number. No dependence on any condition number. So the magic of this uh, is that this kind of uh, metric that we cooked up based on geometric configurations, now that we finally proved it, it somehow warps everything in just magically the right way and gets rid of all condition numbers. So this is, again, with exact gradients, but sometimes this is helpful to think about what would an exact algorithm do, but because uh, normally with uh, certain methods, like first order methods, and even first order methods without a Hessian, you often get Hessianish problems. Uh, and there's no Hessian here because it's an LP. So this condition is doing something, but magically there's no condition number. Ben. So if you look at the barrier, what kind of dependence do they indicate? Uh, great. So, so we'll come back to the inexact and sample complexity. 
Uh, but the first, the first thing before we've been getting into sample-based estimators is does the exact even work? Because once we have that, then what Ben is suggesting is if we know the exact path works, then we just need a stochastic approximation to the exact path to build up errors. And we know this bad example I had before is clearly going to have tremendous variance. Uh, but the surprising thing is the exact path, there's absolutely no condition number. And it's a super clean analysis. And any guesses for the analysis? Okay, what's uh, people's favorite online learning algorithm for regret? It odds. It odds, yeah. <laughs> what's, what's your favorite algorithm for online learning? For online learning? Sure. For regret? Both. Mirror descent. Mirror descent. Yeah. So, so basically, exponential weights is the analysis of this. Uh, it turns out that this was implicit in this earlier result uh, due to Ayal uh, uh, and Yashai that uh, you got a worse rate. But then when we realized this, uh, this is, you know, even though it's non-convex, you can apply this mirror descent analysis. And the proof is super short. And we improved the rate in this version to actually be 1 over t. So it's kind of a, a hidden analysis based on mirror descent. But once we have this analysis, it actually is very helpful when we start thinking about uh, the issue with approximate gradients and sampled gradients, sort of Sanjeev's and Bin, uh, Bin's question. Because right now, we're getting exact gradients. And worse, we're working with this tabular parameterization. Now, of course, that is obviously the natural place to start. Okay, but with this analysis, it gives us a lens into dealing with approximation issues. Yeah, this is the magic of uh, we just, uh, Jason was like, shouldn't we get a fast rate? And we just did it for a while. And you just do the usual self-bounding trick. And we can look at the, the proof is like super short, but magically you get a fast rate. Uh, so a lot's pointing to the, the fact that this convergence rate is 1 over t. Uh, and that for those in the area, that's a little surprising for this style of analysis. But it turns out. Um, you get that. And you get rid of the dependence on the actions. There's no kind of log uh, A from the starting mirror descent potential. Anyway, that's technical comments. We can come back later. Uh, let's jump to function approximation, because now we have a tool in the exact case. I'm not directly going to deal with sample size issues, uh, but sample size issues and approximations are really two sides of the same coin, because there's, in a sense, going to be errors in our gradients. Okay, and it turns out when we start considering function approximation issues, uh, it's very related to robustness. So let's have a quick detour and look at robustness, because when we're training in simulators, we're, we are trying to get these things to work in practice. Okay, and let's start with one of these toy examples, uh, which is we want this thing to hop. We've trained this hopper uh, to hop only from one starting configuration. So we train it in one particular position from, say, some S0. It actually gets up with one of these policy gradient methods. But now let's uh, perturb it. Okay, so now we take this train system. Uh, we give it a kick. Oh, it's falling. It's slow motion for dramatic effect. Uh, and it tries to get up. It was able to get up in its own starting configuration. But uh, now it can't. Okay, and this is another thing. This runner, it knows how to get up. It can't. Okay, it, it got knocked down into a new configuration, and it's stuck. Okay, so we're training a system that works just fine from a particular starting condition, and it breaks from perturbations. Okay, this is pr pretty generic for many of these systems. Okay, so how do we fix this? Well, one natural way is let's just train it from lots of different configurations. So we pick a measure mu, and we're going to train it from lots of different configurations. Okay. And, and this is done in practice. Okay. So a any uh, questions? Is that clear? So mu is going to be a distribution of a starting state as 0. And now we're going to try to optimize our objective function such that it has high value with respect to this distribution mu. Okay. And this is basically uh, what they did in this impressive uh, recent uh, demo from OpenAI. So this is this uh, dexterous uh, hand manipulation uh, task from OpenAI, where 
Uh, just literally this week, I was talking to Sanjeev that we're going to see a lot more impressive demos uh, with hand manipulators, which are considered one of the most challenging robotics tasks. And this Tuesday, they dropped this. And you know, so this is showing that it's actually non-trivially robust in that you know, they can move it around. It's never seen this in training. It pushes it around a little, and it's still able to keep it stable. And it solves it. And you know, there's a lot of joints here. And you know, obviously, the solving the Rubik's cube part isn't the hard part. That's an algebraic thing. But it's just turning this cube with one hand with all these joints and all the noise and uncertainties. Okay, and the way they train this is they call this uh, domain randomization. But basically, it's you just have lots of different configurations of MDPs and noises and things like that that you add to it. Okay, uh, so you have this start state measure mu over states and different parameters in your physics simulator. Okay, so uh, so we're going to consider a modified objective function rather than just training from the objective function S0, we're going to train our objective function from a distribution mu over states. So even though we might care about our performance for a particular configuration S0, we're actually going to train it from a distribution mu. Okay? And note this is an assumption, because if we're truly acting in the world, we might not have access to this. But when we have a simulator or so someone helping us out, they can often place us in di different configurations to train on. Okay? And under the assumption that we have such a distribution mu, this, uh, this guarantee of uh, this conservative policy iteration algorithm that I alluded to earlier, that actually has a guarantee in terms of this measure. Okay, so, uh, so this is a training objective function. Uh, when we had this measure mu, this old al algorithm had a guarantee. But of course, a question is, what happens with the style of policy gradient methods? Okay, and the short answer is it turns out this natural policy gradient algorithm, uh, after a long while, the guarantee is really identical to this CPI algorithm. Okay, so, uh, so let's come to that. Uh, actually, it's an uh, interesting side note that uh, uh, RL at that point it wasn't all that popular. It was just a few theory-ish people, and the theory people were fringe doing it. And I remember when I gave the CPI talk, uh, Shandroy was actually in the audience. He was like one of the theory people, and he was like very uh, supportive of the result. And I think everyone else was like, this is weird. Uh, but uh, it's interesting to see how well that took off and how that was one of the strongest guarantees. Uh, but now we'll see that uh, gradient methods basically have the same guarantee, which is a little surprising. So let's quickly back up and just remember our policy classes. Now we're going to look at this linear policy class and this neural policy class. What are the guarantees when we run natural policy gradient methods? OK, so it turns out there's two uh, notions we need, to, we need to consider. So the first is a notion of compatible function approximation. OK, so uh, this is an average case regression error. So the first assumption is saying, that how well can our d-dimensional features w, uh, I'm sorry, there should be a min over w there. Okay. So uh, there's a min over w there. It, and that statement is uh, assuming that our d-dimensional features, on average, can well approximate the state action values. Okay. So this is really the goal of supervised learning, which is average case approximation error. So suppose for a moment our features could well approximate the state action values. Okay, and all we really need is the, for this to happen on the state action values we see. Okay, now we have this much stronger assumption, uh, which is that uh, this worst case ratio gamma, that's the ratio between uh, the chance we reach S under the optimal policy versus the weight we've put on it. Okay, so, so this is definitely pessimistic, uh, but it turns out even with such a factor, all the other algorithms can't get a guarantee even of this form. Okay, so what's the guarantee? So, so the questions about these assumptions, the first is really just a reduction-based assumption. It says, on average, we can do supervised learning. Okay, and the second one is going to tell us how we good we do is a property of how diverse this mu is. Like we want, you know, we, what do we want for this mu? We want to take our best guess as to where the optimal policy tends to visit. 
Uh, yeah, Dan. Yeah, you would have to make some continuity assumptions to, to make it true. Uh, and if you think about it, there's a sense in which you should never be able to agnostically learn in a continuous world with even average case error. So there has to be something L infinity going on unless one makes much stronger assumptions. Okay, yeah. So this is still bad for that spoon example. Uh, yes, except we get to pick, pick mu. So that's the point. So let's go. We get to pick mu, and that's what we do in practice in these diverse conditions. So we'd pick mu to be spread out. And this is really what's actually done in practice. Because the shortcoming of policy gradients, as we see from this, is it doesn't solve the exploration problem. We actually have to either do some kind of imitation learning, or this is much weaker than imitation learning. We just have a rough idea where the optimal policy tends to visit, and we spread it out. But is that basically solving the problem and giving you the gradient? Uh, no, because mu can be like a factor 10 off. So this is much worse than imitation learning. So imitation learning is solving and giving the agent. Right, whereas this, uh, you could actually be a factor of 10 or 100 off, and it's pessimistic in a, in a lot of ways. Okay. So let me give the guarantee and explain why it's pessimistic, because I think it's a very good theory question here. Okay. So the proof of this is really just pushing it through the mirror descent analysis. Turns out in response to Alad's question, I don't know how to get 1 over t now here. Uh, a is the number of actions, but this first term is going to 0. This is how well we do. And the second term has our error in it. So this epsilon is great, because that's an average case error. This is very pessimistic. Uh, it's not quite solving the, the problem in the way imitation learning is solving the problem, because this could be much worse than an expert's demonstration. And if you understand where this is coming from, I think this is just a great theory question. What's really going on and why this is pessimistic, this factor is purely due to transfer learning. Okay. So what happen, what's going on is that you have a guarantee with respect to a measure of mu, okay, and what you're tested on is a different measure. Okay, if you can transfer, you're good. Okay, and, and, and formally, this is the best you can prove unless we get a better understanding of transfer learning. Okay, but this is much weaker than guarantees we get, say, from approximate dynamic programming, because this is transfer learning just to one distribution. Yeah, Dan. So if you're dynamic for, say, the shift or whatever, that might mean you're either expecting to learn like a box of some kind of random rate. And this almost looks like a, like a supremum norm of the rate. Yeah, yeah. So certainly in, this is a good question, certainly in my thesis when I was talking about this for CPI, that basically there's a, when you're thinking about supervised learning, RL is really about a transfer learning problem. And as you know, in transfer learning, you could do L infinity ratio based bounds, or you could do mass shift bounds. So I actually gave in my thesis the mass shift version of the bound. Uh, so I think basically what's nice about this compared to other methods is this is transfer learning to one distribution. Okay. Uh, but we're just giving the worst case bound based on that. But that's much better than dynamic programming, which is basically transfer learning to like a pathological distribution. So another question? OK, so it's pessimistic. But at the end of the day, we're trying to get agnostic bounds where we can say something about supervised learning, because the first assumption is great. This is average case regression. Okay, but it's the second one that's pessimistic. But the second one can formally be stated as just a transfer learning error. Uh, I believe so, yeah. Uh, I don't think we've written it down, but this is not too hard to come up with. Okay. Um, I, I bet it matches it even with the poly factors. The first one I'm pretty sure is sharp. Uh, I, I bet it's sharp for all of the factors, actually. Um, okay, so that's this linear case. Okay, so we'll wrap up in a moment. What about the uh, neural case? Okay, so the neural case is instead of Grad phi, we want to use f. Okay, so what do we think is going to change? Okay, so uh, in a sense, if you look at this, the guess for how all that's going to change is the, the regression error. So all that's going to change is rather than using phi in our 
assumption for the compatible approximation error, we'll use the gradient of f, right? Because what's the gradient of f for the linear policy class case? It's phi. Okay, so this is pretty slick. So for the neural case, we get the same theorem. OK, sorry, there should be a main over w. But our error now is with respect to the gradient of f. OK, so what matters if you're doing deep RL with some deep neural network, uh, the, the quality of your function approximation really depends on sort of how rich your function approximator f is in terms of its gradient, which is kind of how it can move. Okay, and that you would expect to very well approximate Q because it's very high dimensional. Okay, and we still have this pathological worst case ratio, uh, and we get exactly the same bound. So that linear one is really just a special case. Uh, and again, we need to understand transfer learning better to strengthen this bound. There's some related work utilizing uh, these similar ideas with NTK for this approximator, but it's really a more general phenomenon uh, here. OK, so in summary, we do have a, a pretty broad characterization of policy gradient methods. Uh, in the paper, not just the natural policy gradient, though that's the cleanest one to understand. Uh, and this characterization is very helpful because it both shows its strengths, which is how it can really utilize uh, function approximation, and the weaknesses in terms of this measure mu because at the end of the day, it is a local search problem that's trying to solve a problem with exploration. But on the other hand, people are using this tool in practice and finding ways to solve it by this measure mu. So in terms of, you know, so there's, so there's a lot of both, there's a lot of new questions here, and I think it's pretty clear that a lot of the theoretical questions in RL are different from supervised learning. And you know, to, to get things to, we, we don't just want theoretical uh, algorithms here. We want, like, this is a space where our better theoretical algorithms really could give rise to better practical algorithms. And for this, I think a better understanding of transfer learning is pretty critical. Uh, also, better heuristics or theory of how we think about getting uh, exploratory distributions, because this assumption on mu is certainly much weaker than imitation learning, because, in a sense, that's a true reduction to supervised learning. Uh, this isn't, uh, but I hope I've convinced you there's really uh, a lot of open questions here. There's a lot of incredible progress we're seeing in this area, and this is joint work with uh, a number of uh, long-time and great collaborators. Well, Gov is a new collaborator. He is a graduate student at UCSD. Uh, Jason Lee is amazing. He's, uh, you guys are lucky. Uh, joined here at Princeton, and Alex has been a collaborator of mine for also quite a long time, and he's at Microsoft Research. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.